Welcome to our church for under deliverance, and I really hope that the message today is going to bless you. I want to speak about bringing church into the workplace. About three years ago, God started to lay this on my heart about the gap that there was in my own life between church and the workplace. I was a hard taskmaster and a difficult manager. I was rather intolerant of any faults anybody would make at work. And yet on a Sunday, I was in the church being the perfect Christian, preaching, teaching, and there was such a gap between those two lives of mine. And the Lord started to really speak to me about bringing the church into the workplace. Perhaps you, like me, we work in the corporate world. It's a difficult place to be. There's high unemployment. There's low levels of tolerance. People are arriving at work already frustrated and irritated because of the long hours that they sit in traffic to get there because we experience load shedding and the traffic lights don't work. So we're already arriving at work at the beginning of the day in a not so great emotional place. Perhaps you post-COVID have still been left to work at home in your home office and your company haven't brought you back. So there you are all by yourself, no one to have a coffee with, no one to chat about your week or about your weekend. There's no relational um, exchange taking place. Maybe you're the mom or the dad that are raising the children, the next generation, and that is a work of a different kind, but it's work nevertheless. All the schoolwork, the different ages, the different maturities, the different sports and sports times, the washing, the ironing, the cooking, and everything that goes with raising that generation, it's all part of your workplace. Maybe you don't have work, and you are out there sending out CVs, putting out applications, but you don't have any success, and you don't ever hear back from the companies that you're applying for. The workplace at the moment is not the easiest place to be. And for us to learn to bring church into the workplace, we need to understand what the word shares with us about that. In my own life, this year started off quite well at work and I was having a really good time until about a week or two ago. By nine o'clock in the morning, everything was going wrong at work. Um, I'd been called into some meetings and some of the, the, the senior people were quite frustrated with decisions that I had taken last year. And they were now recalling those decisions and questioning them. And I found myself very, very frustrated by 9.30 in the day. And I thought, you know what, Lord, I want to give up. I just want to throw in the towel. I want to let go. I'm tired of this. And I'd like to actually walk away now. I've retired and I'd rather we just walk away. And right there in the inside of my heart, I heard this tiny little voice that said to me, Debbie, Debbie, you cannot give up now. I am asking you to preach on Sunday about church in the workplace. Bring me into your workplace now. Call me into your workplace now. So I got up, I closed my office door. I put my head in my hands and I just said a simple prayer. I said, Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you come and help me to understand what all this questioning is about? Would you give me the insight and your wisdom to be able to have these crucial conversations with maturity so that I can reflect you? And the Holy Spirit did just that. He did come and he did help me. You see, it doesn't matter where we are in the workplace. We can look just at formal work, but God is looking at every work that our hands do. It's a worship before him. And he is saying, bring the church into your workplace. Now, for many of us, that's quite a strange thought to bring the church. You mean I must have a cell group and walk with my Bible under my arm? No, that's not what God's talking about. God's talking about us being connected and being part of and adding value that comes from his throne room, that comes from the boardroom of heaven. We are to bring it into the church place. There was a poll that a company done in America a couple of years back. They're in an, an analytics company, and they established that out of the world's one billion full-time workers, 
only 15% of people are engaged at work, leaving a significant 85% unhappy in their jobs. And this was across all faiths and across all races. Now, if we go on the internet, we'll find big names of Christians that have done much for God in the workplace. My question is, where's your name? Where's my name? We are called as God's people. And if we are called as God's people, then we are to bring the kingdom and to bring heaven down right there in the workplace that God has positioned us in. Yet what I found in my life, the majority of my life I wanted out of that workplace. I didn't want to be there. And I realized that Joseph didn't get an out from Pharaoh. Esther didn't get an out from the king. God had put them there and destined them to be there so that they could bring about his plan in the workplace. And so it is with us. God has destined us to flourish in the workplace. And this 85% of unhappy people in their jobs, we can see it in our own country. Wherever you go, if you're going to the shops, if you drive on the roads, if you're going to the hospitals or into um, universities or schools or anywhere, there is a huge amount of disconnection in the workplace by the workforce. The service levels aren't great. The response to customer complaints aren't great. All around the workforce fits into this 85% that this company analyzed in our own country in South Africa. And Jesus spoke about this. Jesus was not unaware of this situation and this disconnection that people would have. They would be physically present, but they actually would be disconnected. So in the book of John, chapter 15, verse 1 to 3, is where we see Jesus beginning to set the stage for us in the workplace. He says, I am the true vine, the grapevine, and my father is the gardener. Who's the gardener? The father. That's who the gardener is. It is not your boss. It is not your pastor. And it is not your president. Then he goes on to say, and he says, And he, the gardener, cuts off every branch of mine that does not produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. So yeah, Jesus is very, very clear for us. And this is such a concept I had to get in the workplace. That daily the Father is the gardener. And daily the Father makes an assessment of my productivity. He makes an assessment of our produce and how well we're doing. And he decides what he's going to prune and what he's going to cut back because he's looking for more out of us. He goes on in verse 4 to 5, he says, Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. So Jesus is very clear here. What is going to help us produce? What is going to put the energy back into us? What is going to put the empowerment back into us? What is going to give us creativity and innovation and insight is when we remain in him. He says, yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them, you will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So Jesus has set a lovely stage so far. He's told us that he is the true vine. We have a gardener and we are the branches. And it is in connection that fruitfulness takes place, not in disconnection. He continues in verse 6 and he says, Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burnt. But if you remain in me, that's the key. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask anything you want and it will be granted. What is Jesus saying? You may ask me how to solve that problem at work. If you remain in me, it will be granted. 
You can ask me how to deal with that union or that difficult staff member or that customer who's been so difficult. You can ask me why your quotes are not accepted. You can ask me for favor when you're doing job applications, but it's all based on you remaining in him and his word remaining in you. And he says, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. And this brings great glory to the Father. So if you and I go down to Cape Town where there's lots of vineyards, we can walk through these vineyards and think, wow, look at them. They look absolutely beautiful. But there's a process that the vineyard goes through in its growing. As it starts to grow from the vine, the branch, it produces fruit and leaves. And then it continues to grow more and it only is producing now leaves. There's no more fruit. And if it grows even longer, it produces only the branch. There's no more leaves. Now, if the vine dresser, if the gardener does not come and garden in that vineyard, then that portion of the branch at the end with no leaves and no fruit that looks like it's dead, but it isn't because it is still connected to the main source. It will draw all the nutrients and the vine will eventually completely die. So for you and I in the workplace, if we aren't producing, if we aren't being productive, if we aren't bringing our innovation into the workplace and adding value to that company through the vine, through the things that the Holy Spirit would bring, the pruning process has to take place. Now, we get three kinds of Christians in the workplace that we can see from this example of Jesus speaking about the vine. The first one we get are what I call the dead branch Christian. They are mostly in survival mode. They go from paycheck to paycheck. They have no purpose or passion for the business that they're involved in at all. It is simply a job. It's a journey of the broke. They have no ambition. They work long hours with low rewards and they have very low loyalty towards the company that they are working for. They even devalue working. So they're not ethical in their working. They're not integrous. They will go on the internet for hours instead of doing their work. They will steal things from the company like staplers, paper, pens, and all sorts of things, and even steal time. They don't have a value for the work that they were given. They're oblivious to the presence of God in them in the workplace. They don't realize that they are born again, spirit-filled, and that as a believer in Jesus Christ, God has actually gone with them at their desk, and he sees this devaluing, he sees this lack of passion. They live like I did for all those years. They separate work from church. Work is work, and church is church, and don't confuse the two. Sometimes I speak to Christians who want to celebrate Halloween and they'll tell me it's got nothing to do with my belief. I speak to Christians who strike, they tell me it's got nothing to do with my belief. So they separate work and their church. And you seldom hear them pray over work-related matters. The work and its problems and its challenges that it faces as a company is not something they would bear up in prayer before God. And Solomon was very aware of this disconnection with workforce and in the workplace. And he speaks about it in Ecclesiastes 2, verse 20 to 23. I'm going to read from the Message Bible because it puts it so beautifully. He says, that's when I called it quits. I gave up on anything that could be hoped for on this earth. What's the point of working your fingers to the bone if you hand over what you worked for to someone who never lifted a finger for it? Now, in our country in South Africa, this is a common statement. Why should I pay my taxes? Why should I be honest and buy a license? Why should I do all these things because the money just gets handed over to someone who never lifted a finger for it? 
Solomon goes on to say, smoke, that's what it is. A bad business from start to finish. So what do you get from a life of hard labor? Pain and grief from dawn to dusk. Never a decent night's rest. Nothing but smoke. Your dead bronze Christians are sitting in that 85%. And this is exactly how they view business. It's nothing but smoke. It's useless. It's a waste of time. The only reason they're going there is because they need the money that they get from there. But when the vine dresser comes, when the gardener comes and he sees this, he starts to prune and cut off that which is not producing fruit. And in the workplace, it could mean that you didn't get the promotion you were desirous of. It could mean that you don't get the increase you were desirous of. And then we point a finger at the company, but the vine dresser, the gardener, our heavenly father is saying, no, 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 it is me who's pruning you because this behavior is not producing any fruit that would bring glory to my name. The second kind of Christian I see in the workplace is what I call the leafy Christian. The leafy Christian has a works-based relationship. In other words, everything that they do is based on works, what they've achieved, how they've done it, how good the task is, and there's very little relationship if you do not achieve what is expected of you. They live by what they know. Their knowledge triumphs over the revelation of God. They have a knowledge of the Bible, which forms a religion in them, and they stern and they hard and they rule to according to that. They don't mix with people that are not of their faith. They don't want anything to do with people that they judge and see as different. And they measure success by works. They measure their success by works. And they judge other people's failure by their lack of works. So let's look at the story of Jesus with Martha and Mary. Remember, Martha had been very busy because she was expecting Jesus. I can imagine. She was setting tables, putting tablecloths, chairs, knives, forks, salt, pepper, all the food, everything. And Mary just sat by Christ. And what did Christ say to her? Martha, Martha, Mary has chosen the better thing. So yes, there is work that we need to do. But the leafy Christian, when you look at them, when you observe them, they look like they, they're so good at everything they do. But are there fruit in their life? They are task and program driven. It's all the lists of tasks. It's all the programs. If they don't see you at a program, they're upset with you. And they often have a habit of overextension of self and they can burn out. Why? Because they're so busy with all the programs and with all the tasks that they lose sight of relaxing and self-care and relationship. And this was also, the works was also spoken about in Isaiah 64 verse 6. Isaiah says, We have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We are all faded like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Now, if you think of somebody who jogs or goes to gym where they work up a sweat, those garments get sweaty and sticky and smelly and all they ever want to do is get out of them and, and have a nice shower and, and cool down. Now, this is what Isaiah is saying. All your works, all your lists of tasks that you've achieved that you use to judge other people with and judge your, uh, yourself, they're like those polluted garments. They're going to fade away like a leaf and, they, and they're, not, they're not producing fruit that remains. If you think of the story of Jesus when he was walking with his disciples, in Mark 11 verse 13 we pick it up, it says, And seeing in the distance a fig tree covered with leaves. It looked like a good tree. It had leaves. It was growing. It looked vibrant. He went to see if he could find any fruit on it. For in the fig tree, the fruit appears at the same time as the leaves. 
But when he came up to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the fig season had not yet come. So there was a perfect example. Jesus spoke against the fig tree because it didn't produce fruit. Remember in John, Jesus said, My father is the gardener, and he prunes, and he cuts, and he snips. Yeah, Jesus spoke against a lack of fruitfulness. And in the workplace sometimes, we are blaming management, we are blaming the government. If we're working in ministry, we're blaming the pastors or the senior leadership. When things don't produce in our life what we are looking for. But when I read through these verses, I see that the person who's putting a stop when there's no fruitfulness to promotion, it's actually the hand of the Lord. The last Christian you find in the workplace is the fruitful Christian. They bring transformation. They see a problem, they get involved, they think of ideas, they're part of the synergetic thinking team, and they transform the workplace. They change what's not right there, not by pointing fingers at people, but by allowing the light that is in them to shine, by allowing the empowerment and the ideas and the innovation from the Holy Spirit to come forth. They are cultural catalysts. They don't just have an idea how something could be done. They roll up their sleeves and they get stuck in there and they help things to change and they transform and bring this change about. Their character is Christ-like. They walk in the fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, the kindness, the long-suffering, the self-control. It's all visible. They're not swearing at their workforce and going crazy. They can contain situations because they have developed this Christ-like character. They work in connection. They want to connect people to their calling, to the purpose of God for their life, uh, to, to say, even if you, if you have a work that you feel is less than, do it to the best of your ability because you work unto God. They have a supernatural life. For them, miracles, wonders, signs, it's all part of their every day. I have a friend who's a doctor. And she often shares the messages with me that, that God imparts to her when she has patients in front of her, that heals homes, delivers babies from sickness, sets people free where they thought they had one illness and the Holy Spirit is telling her, no, do a deeper look into a different illness and it saves a life. Their supernatural life is just part of who they are. Their faith and their work work together. They don't have dead works. They don't have faith without works. They work in faith, partnering with God all day long. And they are Holy Spirit led. They discern and they've developed an ear that can hear what the Spirit would say to them for that workplace. In Romans 8 verse 19, the Bible gives us an idea of this kind of Christian. It says, for creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Your workplace, your home, your community, your church, your country, it is waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. It is waiting for you and I to connect into the place wholly and fully, not just there in body, but there in spirit, soul and body. Romans 8, 14 tells us who are the sons of God? For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So for us to move from being a dead branch Christian to a fruitful Christian, we need to be led by the Holy Spirit and become a son of God. And I want to share with you just two names that I found random on the internet of men who were spirit-led and who revealed the power of God out into the marketplace and how it changed lives. The first gentleman, his name is R.G. Letourneau. He is a man in America. He was a great businessman. He was an inventor of earth-moving equipment. 
And he had the same struggle between church and work, church and work, you know. And one day his pastor said to him, Brother, God needs businessmen as much as what he needs pastors, evangelists and missionaries. And this man said that that single sentence from his pastor changed his whole way of looking. And he made this statement, if God needed businessmen, I said, all right, if that is what God wants me to be, I'll try to be his businessman. And he was became famous, he became known, he gave 90% of his finances to the Christian causes to look after the poor, the underprivileged, and so on. So this is the same thing, empowered by the Holy Spirit. One sentence from a man of God changed his life. Another person I want to speak about is the Rwandan president, Paul Kahame. Rwanda went through a terrible genocide. And in three months, a million people were massacred brutally. And the country faced having to deal with all these perpetrators and, and bringing them before courts and everything like that. And they realized the legal people, it would take approximately 110 years to prosecute each person who had murdered another person. And they came up with what they called the forgiveness program. Because this president said this statement. He said survivors are the only ones with something left to give their forgiveness. And the forgiveness program, you can go and look it up on the internet. It has produced powerful, powerful forgiveness, healing and reconciliation between people. Now this is church in the workplace. So I don't know about you. Perhaps you are like I was, where I separated my work from my church. And if that's you, today I wonder if God sat opposite you and opposite me, and he said, I planned all these days in your book before you were born. Have you lived each one in the workplace? Would we answer yes, or would we answer no, Lord? There's much more to come out of me. If he asked you today, were you my good and faithful servant? Did you use the talents I gave you in the workplace or did you bury them? What would you say? I want to pray for you that you, like me, can go on a journey with God and bring church into your workplace. Lord, I thank you for everyone who hears this message. I thank you that you would touch their heart. I thank you that they would just call you into the workplace and that one day we would be your true faithful servants and we would narrow the gap. And like these two gentlemen, we would be the ones that have been catalysts to, to heal, to deliver and to set free, but also to make a marketplace contribution that brings glory to you and fruitfulness for those who need it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Dankie dat jy ingeskakel het vir ons online diens. Ons hoop dat hierdie boodskap rechtig ietsie vir jou beteken het en dat het jou geencourage het en jou feit gestuur het. Daar gaan nou een geleentheid wees om te saai in die werk wat die Heere hier sal doen by VL gemeente. Die bankbesonderhede en die QR kode sal nou op die skerm verskyn. Ons hoop dat jylle een wonderlijke week verder sal hee en God sien.